Good evening. Good evening. Hi. Welcome to Kenyatta College. I'm Dr. Jamila Moore, president of the institution. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to take an opportunity to welcome our dignitaries. I believe we have uh, Mayor Larry Moody of East Palo Alto. We also have uh, Shelley Massar, councilwoman of City of Redwood City. And Karen Schwartz, trustee for the San Mateo Community College District. Superintendent Mary Streshley for Sequoia Union High School District. And Simone Kennell, principal with Minnell Atherton High School. Thank you so much for coming out. In support of Hispanic Heritage Month, we are happy to introduce Latino thought makers. I would now like to bring to the stage one of our very own and the first Latina mayor of Redwood City, Ms. Alicia Aguirre. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Well, welcome everyone to our Latino thought makers in Redwood City. This is one of the first, and it's my honor to introduce um, Rick Najera, who's from San Diego, and he was telling me earlier that he's taking Chicano Studies class, so it goes right in with our college theme. We're all studying and we're all students of life, and what's happening today is very important, especially for our Latino community, and I think something like this is amazing that we have it at Kenyatta. So we're gonna watch a little video of Rick and his bio because it was too long for me to speak so they made a video of it. So here it's come. With a chance to really say something different than ones I've said before. You're in for an evening of great conversation. So it's my great pleasure Thank you. 
Latino Hall. May script there, one of only three Latinos in history to write and star in their own show of the world. Let's give it up for Rick Nahira. Oh, so the honorable mayor. I'm so impressed. A, a Latina in politics is what we need now today. So big hand for her. <laughs> so, Always seen as the problem, and uh, we're seen in a way that Latinos are are not contributing to this great country. And I look at that in my own life, and I think that's totally a lie. It's wrong. My family fought in World War II. I lost an uncle in World War II. My father was in World War II. Um, my father went to Vietnam to serve over there for the overtime, which is a real Mexican work ethic. <laughs> so, my brother, of course, was in the wars. Uh, I've gone overseas to, to entertain the troops. Uh, uh, we are America, and we are the part of this nation. That's why Latino Thought Makers, we started this program a while back to really put a voice to people that I believe are the solution. You know, and that's really my core belief. And coming here, this is the first time we've gone to a community college in Northern California. So. <laughs> And that's Dr. Jamila Moore. To bring this program here says a lot. Um, what's great about it, my family's actually from Northern California, my wife's side. Uh, I have two beautiful little children, three, three beautiful little children. <laughs> <laughs> Edit that out. Uh, <laughs> one kid's going to therapy next year. <laughs> three, I was flashing on my daughters. So. And I have a son. So I have three beautiful children, and uh, they're half Mexican and half uh, Irish, so that makes them Mexicans. So, but I sent them to a Spanish language immersion school, so they would learn Spanish. Spanish language immersion school. It's kind of like Spanish waterboarding. It's like agua, agua, agua. <laughs> they speak beautiful Spanish. And when I grew up, I, I grew up uh, uh, in La Mesa, California, 50 miles from the border. Oh, you from La Mesa? Well, you don't hear that too often. <laughs> So I grew up in La Mesa, California, and a little quick story is that there was only three Latino families in, in La Mesa, Mexican-American families. Uh, one was me, and there was a, a Mexican family that lived down the street on a chicken ranch, and I felt they were far more Mexican than I ever was. I saw a chicken walk through their front room, uh, go to the bar, get a Tecate beer, and watch Sabor Gigante. So <laughs> I go, these guys are Mexican. And I told my mom, my mom who's from Boone, Iowa, yes, Mexicans are from Boone, Iowa, she went to Boone, Iowa, and uh, I said, Mama, I want to go play with the Mexican kids down the street. And she looked at me and she said, you are Mexican, you can stay home and play with yourself. <laughs> but that Mexican kid who lived down the street, there's another Mexican family who lived up the street, and uh, that, the ending of the story is this, that Mexican kid who lived down the street is Juan Vargas, a congressman in Washington today. The other Mexican family who lives up the street is Ellen Ochoa the first Mexican-American astronaut, all living in little beautiful La Mesa. So these are the stories that you don't get the chance to hear. You're not hearing the stories about Latinos. And when I say Latinos, we're all part of this country. We're all inclusive. If you want to join Latinos, you're in. And my Northern California family, who is Anglo, has accepted me fully into the family and has treated me with great respect and love. And I, too, have treated them with great respect and love. And our love has created three, correct me, <laughs> three beautiful children that speak Spanish, that love America, love being in many cultures, 
and I think are the future of America. So coming here up to Northern California, which is so beautiful, and up, this campus is beyond beautiful. I saw the fog coming off those hills, and I saw the smoke coming from those hills. <laughs> <laughs> I said, hey, I got to go there. <laughs> and I know there was a wreck on the 101, so some people may be coming in, and they'll make fun of them throughout the show, because they'll, I'll say, that's Latino time, OK? Don't do that. <laughs> but um, so let's start the show. Isai Morales. Isai Morales is an American actor, activist, and performing artist who launched his feature film career as Paco Moreno in Bad Boys, opposite Sean Penn. He has since appeared in several classic movies, including La Bamba and Fast Food Nation. He recently starred in HBO's The Brink and in television adaptation of Robert Rodriguez's television series from dusk till dawn. And you can now catch him on the hit Netflix series, Ozark. He's a great guy, a great friend, an amazing actor. This Brooklyn-born actor is a graduate of New York High School School for the Performing Arts, an outspoken activist. He's a favorite of both late night network talk shows and cable series. I gotta talk this way when this music's playing. <laughs> Isai has been a spokesperson for the Screen Actors Guild, and was recently a candidate for the president of SAG. Throughout his career, Isai Morales has been an advocate for countless charities and causes, including literacy, environment, health, arts funding, and social justice issues. He's in a New York sort of mind. The guy grew up in Brooklyn. He grew up in the tough streets of New York. And look what's happened to him. He became a star. Ladies and gentlemen, Isai Morales. All right, so uh, now this is just what we call Latino thought makers. This is like a, a Latino living room. Now there's Manuro cooking over there, a couple beers, a couple uncles and cousins arguing. Don't talk too loud, Grandma sleeping. Grandma sleeping. But um, I want this to be your time. So listen, uh, it's, it's great to interview you because I've known you for so long. I mean, we've, we've known each other. I mean, how, what, when did you do La Bamba? 30 years ago, yes. <laughs> and at that point, I think I was, I was new to Hollywood myself. I was a, <laughs> I was a child actor on Gentle Ben. I mean, I remember it so well. Uh, and actually, me and you screen tested for that. I don't know if you remember. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, La Bamba. La Bamba. And uh, I remember seeing you then, and I actually got a chance to work with you in, in uh, Tamer of Horses at LACC. So uh, we do go back. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> but more than that, I've always seen you as a guy that truly had a deeper understanding and talked to, uh, more philosophical than I've met most actors that I've ever done. I remember going with you to Puerto Rico. We went to a Puerto Rican, uh, what? Uh, yeah, you've done everything. But I remember just looking at your work and, and your body of work, the depth, the profound depth you've always had as an actor. And I don't mean to, you know, just. We, yeah. <laughs> we normally don't compliment each other that much afterwards, but we do talk. So you've been an actor for a while, a while. A while. You've actually even gone on to, to run for the SAG presidency, which you came very close this year. I know. Fish yeah, <laughs> things happen. But tell me, bring me back to when you first started this business in New York. 40 years ago. Well, first I want to say thank you because it's such a beautiful day that you guys have taken the time to come indoors <laughs> to, to, to talk with us. I'm really grateful. So thank you. <laughs> I'd be out there playing tennis or something. <laughs> 
Well, you actually just came in from New York. You're at the National yeah. Hispanic. DC, yeah. Yeah, so you, DC. You were there with the uh, Danny Trejo. Yeah. And, uh, Brody yeah, Danny I, was his influence and inspiration for all the work he did. And prison. Prison, yeah. <laughs> I was with the, the musical theater troupe in prison, so uh, <laughs> very dangerous for me. <laughs> but now you started, now what was the big inspiration that got you in the business? I mean, I, can, I know mine, but what would you say yours was? I wonder what irony is. Um, I, mean, I was always playing passive kids, you know, and I felt for people. I never was very uh, affectionate. Mm -hmm. I'm a single mom. Um, I don't know. Can you guys hear me? Yeah, can you hear him? Can I put up a little bit here? Yeah. Hello, hello? Oh. Is that better? Can I turn it off? Hello? Maybe I can just project like I did in theater <laughs> 10 years ago. All right, try to bring it up. Bring it up. Go ahead. I think it's off. Is it off? Or maybe it's off. Okay, this is the time we need a technician here. It's me. <laughs> this is live, folks. Yes. This is live. Okay, we can bring it down here. You can bring it down. Thank you. Okay. Um, when I was in in kindergarten or first grade, first grade. I did my first play, mm -hmm. but it was a simple thing, where kids played a rock. A tree, a little river. I was given the part of a Mexican jumping bee. <laughs> and little did I know that I'd be playing Mexicans for the rest of my life. <laughs> I'd never even met a Mexican in the Bronx in the 70s, uh, early 60s. But you play a Mexican jumping bee? So how do you prepare for that? I mean, <laughs> what kind of sense of memory do you do for that one? Well, no, I, I just figured I had eaten enough beans that it would yeah. come naturally, you know? <laughs> Uh, no, I was a little kid, you know, all spastic and jumping, you know. We used to play with them, you know, you, you, you get these little square things and, and, and they'd move. And I'm like, whoa, I'm magic. Um, you know so, why they move, right? Because a little worm There's inside. There's a little yeah. worm inside. <laughs> yeah, later on I end up trying to drink that worm, but that's a whole other yeah. story. <laughs> um, so I loved, you know. Yeah. Mental games. I love theater games. I went to performing arts high school because a troupe from Juilliard had visited my uh, junior high school mm -hmm. and did theater games. And I was baking, and, you know. Yeah. We did trust games. You know the trust game where you blindfold one person. You fall uh, backwards. That too. But this is, this is another one where the kids lie on the floor and then you are guided by your fellow students where to walk so you don't step on someone. And it, it's just these things that we just didn't do normally. And I was just fascinated by it. And I just jumped in head first. And it was like, that I can do, you know? So, um, so they said, you know, this kid should probably, uh, you know, check out Performing Arts High School. And so I, um, I did. And I auditioned there, having run away from home because my mother did not want me to be an actor. I mean, as a parent now, I totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, but at the time... Uh, she was trying to protect you. Of course. And um, I remember seeing Al Pacino in Dog Day Afternoon. I don't know if you guys know this movie from the 70s, an incredible yeah, film great movie. called Dog Day Afternoon, based on a true story. And I was just mesmerized. I was with a friend of mine, and I, and I just said, I, I elbowed my friend, and I pointed to the screen. I remember where Al Pacino had waded too deep to turn around. And he was in it now. He's a bank robbing. And... And this thousand-yard stare that totally drew me in. And I told my friend, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to You know, didn't know what I meant. Of course, you know, what? Rob Banks, you know? <laughs> um, little did I know that it would, you know, this, this is a tough career you, where that becomes like, hmm. Um. <laughs> but you never, I mean, it's a tough career for, for all of us. I mean, everyone. But at the same time, it's, it's amazing. How you do go into this career knowing the statistics, knowing how difficult it is, but you're driven. Yeah, but what the weird thing is that youth is great for that. I mean, that's yeah. a, as many of your teachers will know. When you don't know any better, you gotta go forward, mm -hmm. and you do things that if you knew much more, you'd be like, hell no, you know, I, I want a that's, career. I want something, you know, to what, fall back on. That's why they choose people to be young to be in the army. That's right. <laughs> If you're no, older, it's a little bit hard. I don't yeah. really want to go up that hill. Yeah. No. Why would I do that? Yeah. yeah. No. Um. And and but I just I feel like I had a lot of love 
and a lot of feelings and emotion inside of me. And the only place that I felt I could really let it all out and, and, and you know, express that it was in acting because my mother wanted me to be a doctor or a lawyer. She was a Yenta Puerto Rican mother. Um, and, um, and I felt, well, as an actor, I could be a doctor, a lawyer, a policeman. <laughs> You know, bad guy, you know. And, and not have to go to med school. No way. You know, what if you go to 12 years of med school and realize this isn't for me? Yeah. So I didn't want to do that. And uh, she just wanted me, she said, you need to be a lawyer because you talk too much. And because uh, I'd like, why this and why that? But um, I just feel like I was the kid who would watch a news story about some young mother and her babies crossing the street and, and in, ended up in a crossfire and, and gun battle. Mm -hmm. And I would cry. And I would feel horrible because that's somebody's mother, that's somebody's child. And, you know, it was easy for me to identify with others. And I think that's a quality that you should have to be an actor. To be empathetic. To feel, to feel for, and to have those feelings not too far under the surface because you have to draw upon them. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think the, the, to be empathetic is, is really sometimes lo lacking in our society, you know, big time. And it's like you have to put yourself in the shoes of another person. It's, it's like I've, I've never gone out to a parking lot and said, hey, I'm worried I'll be attacked or raped or something like that. But I, I know women that do. And you have to be empathetic to them. You have to understand their position and their feelings. And the lack of that that we see. But you have a chance to change that with the roles you play. I mean, you know, I used to think that way I could change the world and things like that. Um, and now I'm just, I'd just be happy to make a, a, a good contribution because, you know, as you, as you grow older, you realize may, maybe the world doesn't want to change or isn't ready to change. Mm -hmm. Or wh who are you to think that you could or should change others who are at a different path of their evolution? Maybe some people are further beyond you. Maybe some people need to suffer a little more before they get to that point. So I felt, okay, let me change my world. And in doing so, I can, you know, be that one extra grain of rice in that pot mm -hmm. that, you know, swells. And if we all swell, then, then there's bounty, there's more. But um, I really do believe that my career was born from my imagination and my heart combining because yeah, I was an only child. My mother worked, um, you know, I was left with the babysitters, I was abused, you know, I, I went through a lot. Um, yeah, I remember, because I, I remember when you first came to Hollywood, um, you did have that bad boy feeling about you. I mean, you, you did one of the most iconic roles, which was with Sean Penn. Yeah. You played a character which I loved about that character is your brother's killed by his character. And it's in a strange way, you were able to transcend kind of the stereotype. You gave a heart to a character that was a, a personally a bad character. You know, he's a juvenile delinquent. He's, he's yeah, funny. that was part of the reason that, um, you know, I, I, I've, that was like my big break. Bad Boys put me on the map. La Bamba kind of kept me there. Um, and still with memes to this day. Um, yeah, I remember. Not my first or my last, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Put a little month on your love life, you know. Um, Do people ever yell out, Richie? Yeah. All the time, yeah. <laughs> that's that's got to happen a lot. You know, it's funny because people, does that annoy you? I go, no, because, you know, it's fed me for years and I'm grateful. Um, but to go to the bad boys character, I remember not wanting to be hate fodder not wanting to represent my people as a bad character just because they're, you know? And, and I thought, wow, how am I gonna work in this business? If you, you know, because most of the parts for people like me were, you know, youngish juveniles and we weren't saving the day, we were actually imperiling the storyline and the people you cared about. Uh, even to this day, there are roles that, you know, I look, oh, wow, now that I do it, Huh, okay, I just wanted to add a third dimension. And the one thing that allowed me to do that was that his brother was killed by a fellow criminal. You know, yeah. Sean Penn was no angel. No, Sean Penn, I mean, that's the thing is, I, I remember doing a movie with, with George Clooney. He was the drug lord, I was the drug lord, but I was the bad drug lord. And I'm like, <laughs> what? Yeah. The director tried to explain it to me, and I go, why am I the bad drug lord? Right. And he's the good drug lord. 
Could somehow skin have to do with this in any way? Well, and you're fairly fair. I'm, I'm fairly fair skinned. I'm huero. Yeah. For those that don't know Spanish, it means tall, good looking Latino male. <laughs> Clarify that. Not of the Indian descent. Yes. Um. <laughs> my, now, my, my grandmother is, is very dark. She was Taramuro, you know, Chihuahua, Indian. I mean, indigenous, Indian. Yeah. And she wasn't a real warm kind of woman. Like, she set her own foot. So she wasn't that Ooh. abuela on the chocolate, you know, the chocolate garden. <laughs> you know, for the Mexicans, you know what I'm talking about. The <laughs> abuela with the white hair and the little glasses. She looks so sweet. I had the mean abuela, the Apache abuela that would hunt me down. So, yeah, so, um, where was I? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember my grandmother, wow. Um, but you, you saw some really rough things out there. In New York. Yeah, but the thing was that I just did not want to be the person to hate for hatred's sake. So I love the fact that he had something more than being a Latino from the hood to justify his actions. Yeah. And he was, you know, it was vengeance, of course, unfortunately, um, which I think is a problem in our industry. Vengeance is the motivating factor for most movies. I mean, if you think about that, what are we inculcating into the population? You know, you got me, but I'm going to get you back, and the movie yeah. doesn't end until I get you back or die trying. You know, it's like, when, when is Hollywood going to grow up? Yeah. You know, so it's just something that I, I, I thought about. And I did the part because I said, well, listen, this is a, this is a movie. This is a real, yeah. real fe feature. And Sean Penn was not a big name at all at that mm -hmm. time. He had just done uh, the movie Taps. Yeah. And Fast Times at Ridgemont High actually came out when we were shooting it. And I remember going to the movie theater with Sean Penn and a few other guys and watching him watch himself, <laughs> which was fascinating because uh, he was fascinated by his performance and the whole movie. And I was like, wow, he, he likes it. Most of the time when I would see myself, I'm like, oh my God, oh. Yeah. You know, even La Bamba, I think I cried after the first rough screening. They gave us videos, and all I saw was my hair upstaging me. <laughs> I'm like, damn, man, it was such a good script, man. And <laughs> I thought I screwed up. I was like, oh no. But you were the bad boy in La Bamba. But there was a reason why, and that's why I think you've done as a great as a great actor, is that you, is there's a justification, whether right or wrong. Right. This character knows why he's doing it. And yeah, that, what I wanted was not to be one dimensional, or even two dimensional. I wanted to have a third dimension, because in my life I found out that you know, you know, when you have two friends that are warring and you try to find justice, mm -hmm. they're both right and they're both wrong usually. So you realize that most conflict in life is from people who both believe they're fighting for what's right. Yeah. And that's something that we're not always taught in our schools. We're taught about the good war and the bad guys. and the, But man, Japan and Germany had issues that, you know, if we were in their place, we would be a lot more understanding. Yeah. And, but we're not allowed to, to think outside of our carefully constructed, mm -hmm. you know, boxes. So that's why I think movies uh, and television now with cable have a responsibility to like just make us think a little more and 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 i just yeah uh, so getting back to <laughs> but i digress um getting back to the bad guy character i just want to play human beings that i know you need a bad guy but they're not coming out of nowhere it's not because people are born bad <laughs> you know it's i mean who would you be more afraid of even for you know thematically, story purposes. Your bad guy has to be bad for the good guy or gal to, to, to uh, you know, overcome will mean something. If it's just, oh, anybody, then there's no drama. But you have to have a really, what's worse? A person who's bad because, yeah, or a person who's bad because they've been wronged and, they're, and they're, they have a justification for what they're doing. That, to me, is scarier. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you know, it's like you're in a bar or somebody, somebody's being a jerk, you know, you're not that afraid. But somebody's there that you had an issue with in the past and you may have hurt and all of a sudden, you know, they, uh oh, this person's got motivation. And it, that's scarier to me. Well, that's the thing about an actor is, is the, you know, the motivation, but it's also to achieve the objective. Yeah. You know, so what, what you're doing is you, your character may have an objective. You're going to kill this guy. But you add in the reason why. That's what gives it a multi-dimensional. I have to say, yes. 
I didn't add that. That's the writers. Thank God for writers. Writers created that. I, I added an interpretation that hopefully is credible. Because you can have a reason written in, but if you don't do a credible, if it doesn't come from a place that's organic or authentic, yeah. you're only going to you know, fool some of the people. You know what I mean? You're only going to, you know, some of the folks will buy it, but others are like, mm, mm. That's the, that's the, well, that's the difference between a, a film that truly moves you. I mean, look, there's, I, I worked with Cheech Marin, and I remember one time Cheech turns to me and he goes, I sometimes make pizza, okay? And I was like, what does that mean? It's like, sometimes I make a comedy, it's a pizza. And there's certain, and, and it's, it's, it's relative. It's, it works, you know. There's sometimes, I've watched comedies that are, Totally silly, like Tropic Thunder. And I'm there having a great time watching. There's certain times I'll watch other films. But as a Latino actor, have you seen the changes from when you started to now? I think there are more opportunities. I think music is just the great equalizer, you know, with uh, people uh, who have succeeded way back from, uh, you know, Living La Vida Loca and mm -hmm. Ricky Martin, J Lo, and other folks. Mark Anthony, Pitbull is just you know Mr. Yeah. International. So music is a is is a is a way, just like with the African American community mm -hmm. in the fifties and the, in the jazz era, where it transcended the the conditioned barriers, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and so music has opened doors, and then I see more opportunities in television. But I, you know, I still, I mean, John Leguizamo said it uh, last week. He fired off a, yeah, a missus office. thing. He was very, very sick and tired of, you know, not seeing our community represented properly. And it's, you know, what, what I don't like is that it seems like, you know, like, we want, we want. And it's, it's not... I mean, it's not just wanting, it's deserving. We are a third soon of all the, the students yeah. in this country. We deserve our history not to be relegated to a week or a month or a day, you know. Um, Morgan Freeman said it with, you know, Black History Month. Why should my history be re relegated to a month? It's the shortest month. And <laughs> February. <laughs> um, so, but the... What I want to do is, is, is let people, you know, know through the work that I am he is you are she and you are me and we're all together, man. John Lennon, you know, uh, I am part white, I am part black, I am part Native American, which makes me somewhat part Asian. Yeah. So I, why should I feel less than because I have a combination of cultures and yeah. I, I still struggle to fight mental colonialism where I don't feel like I, you know, I'm not as deserving as certain other folks. Or so sometimes do you feel like, like you're the uninvited guest at the wedding? Yeah, to this day. To this day. Sure, sure. And it's, it's just out of habit, you know. It's, um, who, who, who did it? Uh, somebody talked about, I, I saw somewhere recently that someone had went somewhere, some sort of work situation, and they complained about the Latinos being, you know, and somebody said, no, well, they have such a charming passivity. Charming passivity. And, you know, I get it to a degree, you know. Oh, that's nice. You don't have people going, you know, challenging you at every turn, but charming passivity. It's like, you know, you wouldn't say that about women today. You, won't, you, can't, get, you can't get away with that, you know. Um, you know, maybe you guys should accept your weaker status. No. You know, we all have strengths and weaknesses, and we're not equal. I, here's one thing. I don't believe in equality. I think we're equally important, but we each have strengths that surpass the other, and we have to work together and respect each other's strengths and accept our weaknesses and say, hey, you're stronger in that area. Can you, you know, help? Can we, together, we can really cover more bases than, than not. It's like politics. I am no longer a knee-jerk liberal. I think that when you pick the left or the right, you're artificially bifurcating yourself. You're, you're splitting yourself in two because all of us have things that we're conservative about and things that we're liberal about. So the minute you pick one side, you do it at the expense of the other, and you're operating at half your power. And I think that that's where the media kind of likes to keep us separate. Red and blue, Bloods and Crips, Republicans and Democrats. You know, and I, 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 I 
want to see the day that we can say, okay, okay, I don't like your stance on this, this, and that, but you know what? I appreciate that. It's like with this Donald Trump administration. The easiest thing to do is talk smack about this person, and I think that, you know, we on the left, because I still, I'm, I lean more left than anything, mm -hmm. um, the more we attack in a graceless and classless manner, the more we feed their supporters, the more they are emboldened, the more they recruit and go, look at what those idiots are doing. So why compete? We should have a race down. <laughs> you know, it shouldn't be an arms race up to more tension. It should be a race to see who can be more civil. Who can, be, who can outclass the other? Ah, good point, but sir, may, would you think this? You know, it's like, why? Why do we have to say, oh, you, you know, ran over one of our people, we're gonna run over 10 of yours. That, that ends up nowhere, and the only people that take advantage of that are the people that profit off of our dividedness. So, yeah. I mean, you're saying, you know, an eye for an eye makes the person blind, and it's really true. Uh, I, I think we've, we've seen in America today, and it's, it's, it's kind of a, a sad time, but I also think it's a vibrant time in a weird way. I mean, now the prejudice is really out there. <laughs> I, I was a, I, when I did my show on Broadway, I, I encountered a little bit of prejudice when the New York Times um, reviewer only wanted to see the show in the daytime because he said he didn't feel comfortable seeing a Latino show at night. Oh my God. And it was the New York Times. And I heard that, and the New York Times came, and they were actually, you know, this is, this is you're going to hear the real story always on this show, is that uh, they came and they said, the audience was in stitches, but I just didn't get it. Mm. So I said, you know, us Latinos, we tend to, you know, we'll make lemons, lemonade, and add all The audience was in stitches because we were stabbing each other. Hey, wasn't yes. that funny? <laughs> yeah. What I wrote outside the, the Broadway theater was, audience was in stitches, New York Times. And so it really helped. <laughs> so I was just blatant about it, and I sat there, but uh, the New York One saw the show and gave me the best review I've had in my entire career, and I met the woman. And this is how we, you know, even we all, we all have our own. Problems. What did you say to her, Mom? <laughs> yeah, I wish I had. <laughs> no, what I said to her was this. Actually, I, she came up to me after some event, and she said, oh, I'm the, the reviewer who reviewed your show. And I said, that was the best review I ever had. I, I want to thank you. And she, of course, she walks up. And she looks very white to me, uh, like Swedish white. And um, I, I, I assume, how did you get my show? And I said, how did you get my show? Just out of curiosity. She goes, ah, my husband's Puerto Rican. <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. It was hilarious. It went on and on and caught everything. And I think if we know each other, it's hard to be prejudiced against each other. And that's, so, that's just so true, and that's why we fight. Well, that's why I was in D.C. earlier today, because last night we had our annual fundraiser gala for the National Hispanic Foundation for the Arts. Mm -hmm. And what we do is we raise money to... Um, scholarships. Yeah, for, for scholarships. Not full rides. Unfortunately, we, we don't have that much money, but yeah. we... It's, it's a lunch. We, we, yeah. It's a, you know, help your thesis out here. But more importantly, connectivity. You know, we identify folks that uh, apply for our scholarship, uh, based on their grade point average and their and their desire mm -hmm. to succeed, because we don't want there to be folks that are hired just because they have a Latino name to kind of, you know, give yeah. it some street cred or whatever cred. You know, if this was authentic Latino, whether you're a producer or an actor, we want Latinos or people from our community to really contribute. So we want to support those who are already excelling in their in their studies and who are committed to it, and we, we also like to identify other folks, like you know, Lin-Manuel Miranda uh, and others that have done great things to inspire. And, and I get to learn who the, the next generation of up-and-comers are. You know, but, but the key for me is, if you know us, you'll love us, or at least you'll laugh with us. I, I take mm -hmm. the Jewish-American um, yeah. uh, community. I go, learn from this incredible minority that has under indexes in population, but over indexes in, in cultural um, impact. Yeah. I mean, and we have a show called The Goldbergs. Right? Oh, The Goldbergs is a great show. And, but, but it's funny. You identify with them. We laugh with them. It's harder to alienate or, you know, vilify mm -hmm. a community when you live with them, when, but, when you see that they're, that they're not that different. But The Goldbergs could be the Sanchez. I mean, because when I watch the show, I totally relate to it. I mean, that my mother was very involved 
you know, that sort of thing. And you see it. Is it now that we have, or in your case especially, have really risen? I mean, you, I mean, you've had the moments of La Bamba fame. You've had these certain moments, and then they're waves. They're waves. The Latino wave. The Latino wave. What and happens with waves? They come. They go. Yeah. <laughs> but they also keep coming to the shore. And one thing with you, you are persistent. That's yeah. and also the education aspect, what you're doing with National Hispanic Foundation of the Arts. I recently went back to school myself. I went to Pierce College and I took Chicano studies, <laughs> which in my view is cheating, but, uh, <laughs> I, I did, but I took other courses and I got a 4.0. And the reason I went back to school because I want to teach. I really want to teach. And the first time I ever had a Latino teach me, be a professor, was this year. L my entire life, I've never had a Latino be my teacher till this year. That's a problem. And I'll be teaching here in spring. So, thank you. Where do we sign up? <laughs> but you played, but the roles you've also done, you've been a, a president. That was a highlight. That was a highlight. Unfortunately, whether it's Jimmy Smith or myself, we don't last long. <laughs> How long did Jimmy Smith last as a president? The, the episodes that he won, and they canceled the show right after that. Yeah. So and with me, I'm the president, and they canceled the show. I thought it was a really good show, The Brink. I thought it was a funny I show. It was a great show, too. The, yeah, Obviously, nobody else saw it here, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So, but you played a president, and I think that's where the change starts. Well, here's the thing, you know, and it's kind of awkward to talk about certain things without seeming like, you know, self whatever serving, um, but my job was not just to be a president in a comedy that's kind of zany, but a comedy that's based on reality, because the whole concept of the show is if you really know, knew what was going on behind, you know, the doors in our very, you know, insulated, you know, public policy where the world sees everything so serious, behind the scenes, it's kind of crazy, and the reality is a lot more zany or you know, wild than you think, but my job was to play that president as credibly as possible. Because I've seen castings where, you know, you see that, you know, I call it stunt casting. Oh, wait, you have to have this one and that one. We're filling all the quotas, you know, and that kind of bothers me too, because it's like, okay, wink, wink, we have to be PC. And that's kind of counterproductive because there's resentment. Yeah. But, but the difference is, I, I think with you especially, you've earned it. There's a difference. We, as, as Latinos especially and as artists, we feel we, one, we deserve it, true, but we also feel we have to earn it. And we will work And we harder. should earn it. Yeah, we should. And it's, we've never asked for a, no, no, no Latino artist I've ever met has ever asked for anything special treatment, just treatment, you know? I think J-Lo, though. So you Did J-Lo ask for it? <laughs> It's in a contract. It's a contract. Gets a writer. Like, <laughs> only kidding. green M and M's. Yes, I got it. Yes, and Lechong because yes. she's Puerto Rican. <laughs> yeah, but so the ad audition process for you. I mean, I remember the first time you're out for everything. Has it changed now? Now that you're more established? Yes and no. Now they apologize for bringing me in. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, but you know, thank you so much for coming in. I'm like, okay. Um, there was a point when I was younger and a little bit more full of myself. I'm like, I'm not going to audition for this stuff. Come on, I've been working 20 years. There's YouTube. There's, you know, video. Like, watch this stuff. Why? I mean, this is a character I've kind of played before. Oh, I got to audition for a cop, you know, or the bad guy. Ooh. And I'm like, going, why do I have to do this tap dance? Yeah. Because other people don't do their homework. But well, what Latino actor? But. Yes. When you have a child, all that goes out the window. And I'd go beg in the street to feed my kid. You have a child. You have a, you're married with a kid now. I have a family. Family. You have a family. Yes. How has that impacted you? Mm, I'm about to cry just now. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm the same way. Because we, we both were very single bachelor type guys. And to make the transition to family, kids. It, it, it took me a while. It took you a while. Uh, people were wondering, you know, in my family, you know, is that ever going to happen, you know? But it's, it's, it's like, um, 
It's like choosing to direct. You better make sure it's a really good script. <laughs> You're going to live with it for a few years, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, decision to have a child, uh, whether you're married technically or not, you're married by child. Yeah. And um, there's nothing marries you more than a child. Oh no. And um, and it's just you know, a great director des described it before you know because he knew what we were expecting you know, uh, when I was working on Caprica, and he was a director that was very popular, uh, Michael Nanking, uh, from. Uh, Battlestar Galactica, and he had also directed some Capricas, and he, you know, young kids himself, and he goes, the best way I could describe it, Isai, is, it's, being a parent is like having a license for your heart to run around outside of your body. That's a beautiful, that's beautiful. And it is true. Was it a moment you had with your child that you just went, wow? Last Every night. Day. What happened? She comes to this event with us, and it's way past her bedtime, but, you know, D.C. is three hours ahead, so, you know. We bring her with us. She missed Friday and, and, and you know, Monday and, and Tuesday of school, but traveling to the Capitol, which she's done a couple of times already, is, is like, it's, in, it's educational, yeah. you know? The monuments, it meant nothing when she was, like, three years old, but now she's, I hadn't been to the Capitol until I was an adult. So it's just giving her more experiences and, and a wide breadth of people to interact with and seeing the people that were winning awards and seeing women, you know, leading the way. And we had the, uh, the, the commissioner of the FCC, a wonderful woman speak. And, you know, she's playing her little game because, you know, we can't expect her to be like, yeah. but she's quiet, she's well behaved. And she'll look up and it, it all, it gets registered. Yeah. And last night, you know, I'm like, it was time to go to bed. It's packing because I had to get up at you know dawn, but you know she just I love you, Daddy, the most sincere, and she falls asleep on my legs, you know, and it's just like, yeah, thank you, God. <laughs> it's it's funny. I uh, my kids are, yeah, you know, I've told you a little bit about them, but my little I tried to be a father one day. I'm getting to be angry. Be that <laughs> so I like. I all three seconds? Kids. Yes. <laughs> you have to all listen to me. I am your father. Luke. And then I, I walk out the door, and my little daughter with perfect timing goes, wow, I did not see that coming. <laughs> <laughs> I did not see, I was like, I started laughing immediately. So I totally blew my father, you know, Mystique, attitude. Yeah, Mystique, right, yeah, away. Yeah, the persona. But I think, and I give my, I'm very philosophical, because so I'll give my kids lessons. And one time I gave my kids, it's your opinion of yourself that really matters. It doesn't matter what your brother says or your sister says. I want you to understand who you are. And so my kids look at me and they go, <laughs> <laughs> and did the slow clap. And I was like, you know. What, you're comedians? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but isn't, it doesn't, I mean, how is your acting after being a father? Well. It's effortless, in a sense, to play a father. I mean, it's one thing to imagine, and I've always imagined. I mean, ever since I cried myself to sleep being a, a miserable child because I was not understood or respected enough, mm -hmm. you know? I, I come from a world where you get the, you know what, slapped or beat out of you because you're loved, okay? The kids whose parents did not discipline them ended up in jail on the street with needles stuck in them. So we come from a generation that says, no, no, there's a shorthand here. I'll never want to hit you, but you push the line. And, you know, as a kid, of course, I was like, horrible, burn, this isn't right. But as an adult, especially after watching shows like Jerry Springer and Mari and, you know, seeing kids talk to their parents like that, I'm going, my mouth would be here. <laughs> you know, I'd be like this, what? <laughs> There's something to that. And I think that it teaches you a lesson that you cannot tell your children mm -hmm. about consequences. Because if you give your children everything, which is kind of like, you know, my big fight at home, it's like, honey, don't beat her anymore. She's, yeah. she's 70, you know. No, <laughs> <laughs> But like, you know, how, when are you doing too much for your children? Our job isn't to do everything for them. Our job is to prepare them for the real world. Yeah. 
but you can't do that at seven months either. You know, you, there, there's a, a process where you wean them. And, um, and I just, I remember that my hardest decisions to make is when do you get tough with your children? When do you, no, no, I'm not laughing at you, Joe. Or, yeah, I, I see what you're trying to do here. No, that doesn't work. And then you see them kind of shut down and you're like, oh my God, is it too much? You know, and it's all a balance. Oh, but um, so how did I, I'm talking about, what was the question? How does it how affect your roles changed my since you've been father? Well, it's effortless. It's like right now, I don't have to think about being a parent. It's just that little switch. There are people who play fathers and uh, and there are others who just do it in an effortless way because you know it. It's in your nature. You don't try. The worst thing you can do as an actor, and I don't know if there's any people here interested in acting or the process. Are there people here interested in acting? Okay. Oh, that right. Then this is for you guys. The worst thing you can do is, is you know, push yourself for an emotion that you wouldn't be pushing for in real life. Like right now, I'm not thinking, well, how am I going to say this next line to you guys? It's just a, a, a process of communication. So when you create your characters, you want to get to a point where you're not going, okay, I'm going to say this like this or that, you know? You, you, you realize what the mission is, what you need to communicate, and you just do. And as a parent, you just do. And I was told, look, that you can read all the books you want. It's all going to go out the window. Stay in the back of your head, but you just do. Well, and you're never ready to be a parent. I, 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 I don't know. People can plan having children, and I did not plan on having children. Uh, but when it happens, there's something that just clicks and it all works out. I don't know what it is. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate, I know you have too, but I'm sure you never thought of yourself being a dad. I, I didn't. Oh no, I thought about it since I was a kid. That's what I was saying earlier about, about you know being miserable as a kid because I got, I think, too much discipline at times, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and when I was too much to handle for my mom, because I would block like this and it would hurt her. <laughs> I thought it was clever. I, wah, wah, ow, you know. So uh, my stepfather um, was recruited, and he was a very strong man. And um, it's so wild, you know. I uh, he was, you know, he was telling me I was lucky because his mother threw knives, and they drew blood. That's how, you know. So I was, I was getting off easy. And I'll tell you one quick story. Yeah. Um, I do believe in guardian angels. For some reason, I do believe that somebody up there likes me, you, whoever can accept this blessing. Because he was a, 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 an investigator for the city, um, and I knew he ca he had a 22, a pistol, an automatic 22, which looked like a toy. I was 14 years old. We were living in Queens, and um, he kept it in the sock drawer, you know. And I was by myself, and I remember I'd go up and you know I'd play with it because you know I knew to take out the bullets, you know. And, look at the bullets and check out the gun. And I remember one time I did it, right? And I, was, I don't know why I was walking around with it outside of the bedroom. And I was by the front door and something occurred to me. What would it be like to take your own life? Like, how, what, what, what possesses someone to do this? And I did this. And I did this, and I looked inside that barrel, and I, and I go, wow, what would it take for me to squeeze this trigger? And I'm holding a 22 right here, but it took the bullets out, right? And then I, and I brought it here, and for some reason, right before I squeezed, it was like an angel did this. Because it went, Poof. there was one in the chamber. I didn't know that there was one in the chamber. And... I couldn't hear for like 15 minutes, and I was so in shock. A tiny little hole, 22 doesn't leave a big hole in the door, and I was like, oh my God, oh my God, and shaking, and I ran back upstairs. I put the empty shell casing on the bottom, and I put the other ones on top thinking, oh, I'll never notice that, you know. A week later, I got called upstairs and got the sh shite kicked out of me, and you know, I thought I already learned my lesson, you know, and I thought it was too much, mm -hmm. but that's how you grew up. And I got to say, sometimes people abuse that and 
it messes you up in your head, and you end up being that person to your own children. And um, I, thankfully, I cannot imagine striking my child. Yet I don't need a law to tell me that. And I think that it's kind of unfair for some folks in some communities where that is all they have. We have talking about single parents or whatever. If, if that's how you communicate with your child at a certain point, you know, I, I just think one size fits all can be a little, you know, damaging. And then, I don't know, it's a tough issue because there are people that are dead set. No, there is no reason under any circumstances, not only to hit your child, but to hit another human being. And I'm, I'm all for that. You know, when people say, you should never hit a woman, I go, absolutely, but why just women? You should never hit a fellow human being. Yeah. That's sexist to say, oh, so it's okay to hit a man who's smaller than you, maybe? You know, I know some women that are much more, you know, I, I'd be afraid to hit them, so honestly, you know. Uh, that's a fight you don't want to get in or lose. So, uh, you know, I just think that if it's part of your ideology, fine. But there are some folks that if you cross a certain line, the world will teach you this lesson sooner or later. The world will beat you up. And if you don't learn that lesson at home, like don't mess with certain power. You will get crushed. You, you might learn it the, the hard way. Now, you, of course, in Hollywood, you, you, I don't think people realize you lose more than you win, always, in Hollywood. And there has to have been some moments where, where it was, must have been really difficult. Has there been roles you've lost that just broke your heart? Yeah, and for some reason, I can't think of them. <laughs> I try not to dwell on them. Um, Recently on the plane back, I saw a film. I mean, I barely see my own work. It's so weird. Um, but I, I, I saw a film that uh, I auditioned for and I did not get. Then I saw the person that they hired and okay. And then I'm like, that's an interesting choice. And then I didn't feel so bad. You know, I was like, well, you know, okay. I guess it was inconsequential. I mean, you know, okay, good. Um, they can't hire everybody for everything. So not getting cast doesn't mean you suck. It might mean that. <laughs> it's not out of the equation here, but you can't you can't internalize. Yeah. Not have you know it's, it's like you can't play the lottery and think you're going to win every time. And my father was a door to door salesman, and he always told me a story, and I, I remember it. it's one thing that saved me. He said, "Rick, I I, I knock on a lot of doors." And I knock on one door and they say no. I knock on another door, they say no. He goes, by about the hundredth door, they finally say yes. You got to hear a lot of no's before you finally hear that one yes. And that's sustained me of just going like, when people say no, it's like, great, I'm getting close to that yes, fantastic. You know, I, somebody asked me yesterday, we did a Twitter Q&A, my first, ooh, hmm. um, getting with it. And the question was, what is the, you're like, do you still face challenges in, in, in auditions? Or what, would you, what advice would you give to people auditioning? Mm -hmm. And I go, you know, abandon nervousness because honestly, they need you or someone like you. They need someone. You're helping them. Yeah. You're taking your time, your time to prepare, your time to get there, and you're helping them make a decision. Yeah. You're doing them a favor. Not in a cocky way, like, oh, I'm doing you a favor. But hey, they're looking for, they have a need that you might be the answer for. So the only thing that should concern you, the only thing you should be nervous about is what your character is worried or nervous about. I Lose would, yourself there. Yeah. I, I always look at it, it's like. It's free practice too. <laughs> I, I always tell people, don't think, uh, at CPS I have 2,500 people auditioning for me every year, 2,500. So I see more auditions than anyone should ever in their lifetime. And. <laughs> I always say, on audition, get rid of the word audition, because audition sounds like you're looking for a job. Let's call it performance. Mm. So if you walk into a room and go, I got a chance to perform today. I'm going to do four minutes in front of these casting directors and chance to perform. Then it's a celebration of your art and who you are as a person. Huge, huge advice. Listen to this. And to add to that, yeah. got any ladies out there? OK. What, what wins you over more? Somebody who's extremely insecure about themselves 
or somebody who says, I got it going on. <laughs> Not in a bad way, but, you know, someone who's so confident, so comfortable in their own skin, you wouldn't mind getting in that skin too. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> hey, I like, I like what you got going on because it's infectious. Joy is infectious. And if you approach your auditions or meetings, from a sense of joy, there will always be a little nervousness. That's okay. That means you care. Well, I mean, look, before we walked on stage tonight, Eastside turns to him and goes, I'm getting nervous. I don't think people realize when you're a professional, you get nervous all the time. It doesn't mean you're, there's lack of nerves. It's actually you're just able to understand, to handle the nerves, to acknowledge them. Well, I care. I want you guys to not feel like this was a waste of time. Do you know? So far, not a waste of time, right? Okay, we're good. All right, great. So, but all we're doing is talking about ourselves, Rick, really. Yes, I know. I know. But tell us about yourselves. <laughs> well, we have a question and answer period afterwards, so you're going to get a chance to do that. Is there been ever a bad role that you really felt, ugh, why am I doing this? <laughs> Out of curiosity, come on. Are we being recorded? <laughs> oh, that's uh, right. There we are. No, recorded. no. I'll tell you one thing. And this will get into the metaphysical. Um, there have been a few jobs that I'm, you know, my career has not always been that um, fruitful. We all want to act like, yeah, oh, we're on top. And, you know, people look at me and go, dude, you're working all the time. I go, that's because you see my work all the time. And when I do a job, it gets, you know, aired more than once. And cable and, you know, mm -hmm. so you seem to be everywhere. Dude, you're everywhere. But, um, you know, as we've progressed, you have to work more to make kind of less. It's weird. Yeah. It's, once things happen for actors, is the pay rates have gone down. Yep. And, is, and you have a lot more shows, so they're like, oh, the, the audience is more fractured. So we're not getting as much from the advertisers. There's a million excuses why they don't want to pay you. And then you have to risk losing the job because you don't really know what you're worth until you walk away. It's kind of like in a relationship. You know, when you feel like you're taken for granted, and you stay, and you stay, and you stay, and it's only until you have one foot out the door or you leave that the other person goes, no, wait, wait, maybe, hang on, I, I miss what this was. Wait, don't, you know, come back. And, and until you're ready to walk away, mm -hmm. you know, and, but that's a risk because, again, you have a family to feed. And the more you work, the more people remember you and go, oh, yeah, hire this person. So if you stay away too long, woo, your stock starts to drop. So it's, it's a real tightrope between doing too much, which I concern myself, and, 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 and staying precious so that people go, oh, it's a Terrence Malick movie? Yeah. You know, it's a such and such. Well, they only do things every once in a while, so it's probably good. You know, I've always wanted to keep that specialness, but life has a way of, you know, smacking you around and saying, look, you got to work. And okay, maybe this isn't the most prestigious job, but I learned something from my acting teacher many years ago in high school who said, whatever you do, even if it's a McDonald's commercial, to be, you know, for an example, elevate it. If it's puerile, if it's, you know, just pedestrian, bring something to it that mm -hmm. makes it more than just banal, you know? But elevate I, it. So, so um, yeah. to answer your question, though, because um, you said something that I, uh, I was prefacing, um, I get lost in the preface. Um, there is, oh, there jobs was jobs take. that I, um, yeah, there were a couple of jobs, and I don't want to name names because I think it's unfair to the people who spent a lot of time writing them, directing them, producing them. Um, yeah, no one started off to do, write a bad film or no. do that. Everyone but they happen, you know, right? right? Go figure. Um, <laughs> Could I shave about a third of my credits and feel like, ah, this is leaner, this is a more probably? Yet, I make sure that when I go in there, I bring it. And I don't walk in there with an attitude that like, oh God, I can't wait to go home. I'm doing this for the paycheck or whatever, because that, that's when it, you can guarantee it's gonna, you know, it's gonna be less than. So you, you go in there and you try to, let's make this special. Let's make this about something, even if it's not, you know, something big. But uh, the thing I will tell you is that I did work on a show recently. Um, 
that haunted me. And it opens up a whole other can of worms about what you do as, as a performer who evokes things. You know? So I've, I've had that happen where you play a, a violent role or these roles. I, I, did I can name a name now. Robert so. Rodriguez is from Dust Till Dawn, the series. Yeah. You, I was you know, offered this role, and they kind of wanted me to audition for it. And I was like, no, I think we can do this. And then I had a talk. And I just wanted to work with Robert Rodriguez. 20 years, the guy's been in the business and never worked with me. You know? And I'm like, oh, what am I, chopped liver? You know? So I was excited to work with Robert Rodriguez. I didn't know that he would be there like the first day and then go off and do other things and everybody else would direct, and that's okay. But the character that I played was a, a very dark, you know, underworld, uh, based on a Mayan mythology, mm -hmm. um, snake vampire. I'd never done a vampire thing before. All my childhood, all of my, you know, yeah. 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 you know, Wolfman. Oh, I mean, I, man, that was my childhood. I, monkey man, everything. I, I, so the thought of finally doing a vampire in the Robert Rodriguez Dust Till Dawn thing. And I remember being in Austin, Texas mm -hmm. on a weekend. I wasn't working every day at that time, you know, you do your fittings and stuff, and wow. And I couldn't sleep for almost an entire weekend. And it was weird, because I had already shot some scenes. And I don't know, because, you know, sometimes, look, I've never been an underworld <laughs> demon, okay? Yeah. I've been demonic if you talk to some people I know and we're in arguments like, oh, you're possessed. I'm like, no, I'm pissed. There's a difference. But um, I think something followed me home. And I think as performers, you, ha you need to wash yourself. You know, call it, you know. Olympia. Mental, whatever. But I think you need to leave certain things on the set. And I think you need to pray if you so believe in higher powers um, to be guided in a way that does not sink you. Because even La Bamba. It was a dark character. There were demons inside that I was opening up. Because in La Bamba, I wasn't just playing Bob Morales, who I was blessed to have known and is still around and is an amazing person. I couldn't have done what I did in La Bamba without the real Bob Morales to draw from. Little mannerisms, little chicanismos, you know, that, you know, made my performance specific. And, um, and you've been loved by Chicanos for that role. Let me tell you something. That's one of the things I'm most proud of because, you know, I've seen grown homies almost cry when I go, what, you're not Mexican? You know, like, <laughs> <laughs> like, well, what? I swear to God, at one point I thought this is going to hurt, you know, like, I was like in East L.A. Yeah. and the homie with the socks up and the shorts and everything. And he looked at me and I thought, oh, sh this is okay. I go, no, no, but I, hey, I'm honored to be an honorary Chicano. And I say that. I, I'm proud of my heritage, Puerto Rican heritage. But I'm not the kind of person to wear that or any other flag on my head, be it American or anything, because I think when you talk about yourself yeah. or your, even your own culture, you know, with Latino this, Latino that, we run the risk of over, over, overdoing it and alienating people who are not within that, you know? So I tell people, whether it's, you know, uh, ethnic studies, whatever, enjoy your culture in a way that doesn't lock people out of it and make them feel like less than for being there. Yeah, I, I mean, I think Inclusiveness. People, yeah, inclusiveness. I, I, I remember when I first started school, uh, there was a Chicano organization that I was accepted at USC, and I didn't have a scholarship. So my dad's like, go to Chicano, Mecha. Mecha will get you a scholarship. So I go to Mecha, and I, I remember it so clearly. It was USC, Mecha, Mechista. The guy was total Chicano. Tell them what Mecha is for those who don't oh, know. Oh, Mecha is Movimiento Estudiante Chicano de Aslan. They still don't. It's in English. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Um, um, uh, do some of you want to know? <laughs> OK. okay. Movimiento, movement, movement, estudiante, student, uh, Chicano, 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 Aslan. Not Mazatlan, Aslan. <laughs> Just to be clear, not Mazatlan. So this Mecha guy was there, and he looks at me, goes, look at you. Oh, güero, and not speaking good Spanish and shit. Look at you. I don't think you felt enough prejudice or oppression in your lifetime to join the Movimiento Estudiante Chicanos Islam. <laughs> I 
I was like, don't Orale. you milk goat? Does right now count? Yeah. <laughs> because, so we can, you know, it's nothing worse than when your own culture is prejudiced towards you. Yep. And, and the truth is we come in all sizes and shapes and colors. And, and part of what Latino thought makers is, is not just for Latinos. It's for everyone. Because the Latino experience and the African American experience and all the other experiences are all part of our collective experience. Human experience. Our human experience. So that's an important part of this. Now, let's talk about this Ozarks. Ooh, yes. I don't know if anyone's seen Ozarks. Okay. Just when I thought I stopped playing bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because, you know, one of the questions. Uh, my, my producer put on here. Was, I'm not going to use it. You use it, use it, use it. Oh, it is. Uh, bring it, bring like, it. Latinos regularly get casted as drug dealers. Now, what do you play on Ozarks again? I am a financial advisor. <laughs> I am a, yes, a uh, money a cleanser. Money cleanser. Yes. Uh, we, uh, fi you're dealing with finance. Finance recycling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, and I thought about that because, you know, again, like from bad boys on, I'm sensitive to being, poor, you know, to being cast as somebody who's going to actually hurt the image of the people that you're trying to, you know, represent in a yeah. better way. Because we've seen enough of the yeah. bad guys that are bad for bad we, sake. We have a president that says we're, all of us are that. Well, no, let's be fair. Let's be fair. You said those illegal ones coming in and some he... Might be good. Presumes might be okay people, right? Yeah. Bad choice of words. I know what he was trying to do. And you want to know something? So many Latinos are supporting the Trump administration because they don't want to be lumped in together. And that's something we have to respect. So I'm a, I, I like to be precise. That's one, you know, call it the, uh, you know, well, certain part of my culture that believes language is the key to communication. And if you're not precise with your language, you're asking for trouble. Mm -hmm. Whether it's in a relationship, a personal one, or in work, you really should, you know, the, in the beginning was the word for a reason. Anyway. Um, but, but it's true. I mean, you have to be precise. Like, you like, have to be precise. And, and also how you say things. Like I learned to not be so cruel in my speaking. Like I'd say, you make me feel sad when you act so stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so it's not really a way of feeling. Right. Yeah. It's all context is everything context. and how you phrase it. But I thought about this character and man, he does some bad things. And I, you know, I, I didn't know the full, the, the arc of the character at the end. They kind of told me halfway through. Um, and I had to weigh it. But what I loved about this character, he wasn't just, you know, a dumb bad guy who was bad because he was from the other side of the border or anything like that. He was brilliant. He was a businessman. He was a family man, and he came from a culture where you just don't do certain things. And I'll give you a great story if, if we have time for it. We have time? Okay. Because people go, oh, how did you prepare for that part, you know? And the thing is that, you know, there's no, like, um, cartel, you know, class to take. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? It can get you in trouble if you get a little too deep. But I had a uh, cable repairman for one of the major companies come into my home to what I had asked for was to put hard wiring into all the rooms so that I wouldn't have to have so much EMF pollution, you know? As it turns out, that wasn't his job. And that cost extra money. And I was a little disappointed. And I called the, my assistant at the time. who was like, and she went, no, no. I told him to that. And she was kind of telling him, well, you tell him. And, then, you know, um, I'm like, oh, okay, I'll talk to you later, Rosie. And, um, and I said, I'm sorry. Because, you know, I understood. You know, that's not his job. I can't force him to do what he can do. But on the way out, I said, so where are you from? Chapin? Because he looked Guatemalan to me. And Guatemalans have a certain look from a certain, like, you know. Oh, they, Mayan indigenous. Yeah, Mayan indigenous, kind of a broader jaw. And he goes, no. I'm like, oh, OK, what are you? So Mexicano, very proud, you know. Oh, OK, no worries. As we're walking out the door, I go, so de, de que parte? Where from? Where from? You know, what part? He goes, Sinaloa. I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> Um, Sinaloa is known as a, an area that's very fun. 
Okay, someone's from Sinaloa. I just want to be careful. From, from what I understood, Sinaloa is probably the birthplace or one of the, the, the strongest cartels is from Sinaloa. Yeah. And it turns out that his last name was the same as one of the names that I had heard for like the last 20 years. One of them. He, so he's directly related to one of the, you know, the families. But he wasn't in the business. He left. He and his father were business people. But they grew up in that world, and I kept them there for an hour. I kept them in my house, and I said, you don't have to go anywhere right away. Can you, do you mind? I'm, I'm going to do this thing. I really want to know. And I thank God that I had that, because I, you couldn't have ordered that up. You couldn't have Googled that. But he yeah. told me things mm -hmm. that helped me, especially when people are like, man, you were so calm and cool. You were so matter-of-fact in this character. It was what he told me and the way he told me. He would tell me things like, you know, the whole community, everybody knows that, you know, this is part of the industry. But he told me the birth of it. He told me how they used to grow corn and uh, beans, these farmers, until certain people from certain government agencies of neighboring countries told them to grow poppies. Because the Vietnam War, our soldiers were not doing well unless they were medicated. Okay? And their access to the Golden Triangle was at times threatened. They needed an outside independent source of the medicine. And I was like, really? Wow. And then he told me about the railroad that 100 years previously an American had founded to take produce up from Central America mm -hmm. through Mexico up to Texas. And how that rail line was then, you know, appropriated for different kind of crops. Mm -hmm. And... He said to me, there's a saying in our community. He goes, por aquí no se anda chueco. He says, you don't walk crooked around here. I'm like, really? I go, so tell me, so, you know, what does it take to get you, like, in trouble over there? I'm like, what does it take to get you killed? Huh? You know, $5, $500, $5,000. He goes, $5, $500, $5,000. If you're a thief, you're a thief. If you'll steal $5 from me, you'll steal $5,000. Mm -hmm. And in a way... I realized that for them, it's a way to clean the gene pool. If you're stupid enough, knowing the consequences, to do that, they don't got time for you. Because you're a threat to the whole community. You'll do other stupid things. And, you know, it's just the matter of factness of it. it chilled me. And he told me things about, you know, and I said, and, you know, he they take out your whole... Like, there's nobody left to avenge, avenge your death. Your dog and the parrot who might squeak. It's, it's annihilation because the stakes are so high. And I was like, damn. Well, I mean. <laughs> and he also told me about the growth and the power these people have yeah. is beyond anything we, we're, we're aware of. They have intelligence agencies within their own. There's so much money. They know when you're crossing the border. They have checkpoints where you think it's Mexican military, and it's their guys fully dressed and trained. And I don't know how much I could say, but you know. Yeah. <laughs> I know I was going to start moving my chair this way. Uh, <laughs> no, but he, he he literally said to me, especially in the Baja or whatever, if you're driving down there and your 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 face and your picture is one of that, that's the end of the line for you. You're not going to where you thought you were going. So, you know, if you don't respect this power, it's like trying to go against the United States. You know what I mean? Like, you know, mm -hmm. there are, and then there are people that we trained that they go ahead and they co-opt. Mm -hmm. And they'll be like, so we understand you got trained by those guys. Cool. You're going to train our guys the same way you were trained. They're like, no, I'm sorry. Okay, I'm going to give you a phone and there's your wife. Tell her you're not going to do that. I was in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I don't tell this story too often. I went to Ch the Mexican government invited me to Chihuahua, Chihuahua, Mexico, to see where my my family grew up. So they, they had a bodyguard for me, and and I was like, you're like I can take care of myself. <laughs> well, I didn't think that. I was more like, I'm not that well known. <laughs> right. You know, it's more like, you know, really, you know, maybe someone else, but I'm I'm fine. I'll just think I'm a tourist. So we were walking in a part of Chihuahua that's a pretty tough part. And uh, 
five guys in a car start driving by, and they keep driving by. Now, ironically, I'm with two other Latino guys, and these guys are Hollywood actors, and they have shaved heads. So they look pretty tough, and, uh, but really not at all. And so the, the bodyguard looks at me, and he goes, Sicarios. And I go, oh, he's a great muralist. I'd love to see his art. <laughs> Can't wait to see Sicarios. Is it around here? Is it a mural? Because I'd sure like to see Sicarios, because I love his murals. And he looks at me, he goes, Sicarios. And he says it four times. And he, he goes, we have to leave. So I go, OK, I guess we're not going to see Sicarios. I'm really disappointed, but it's OK. We'll see it later at the museum. And we get back to the hotel, and he starts talking to him. And he goes, I said, uh, you kept saying Sicarios, so we're not going to see him? He goes, do you know what I'm saying? And I go, Sicarios, right? The, the mural is. He goes, Sicarios. And he says it again. I go, he goes, Assassins. And I said, I've never heard that term. My the movie parents, hadn't come out yet. Yeah, the movie hadn't come out. My parents never said, hey, pass the Sicarios here, son. Or it never came up in a conversation at home. I and knew it from a Colombian first there. And I you learned it? Yeah, yeah, I had never heard it. But what he was saying was, these, and I said, how do you know they were sicarios? How did you know? And he turns to me and he goes, because they kidnapped me. Mm. I said, you're my bodyguard, yet you got kidnapped. Yeah. <laughs> Check, please. Check, please. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo, look at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but I, I saw something I'd never seen before. And I go, so who do you normally bodyguard? Because yeah, I'm thinking, right. you must be the worst bodyguard there is to get captured, <laughs> kidnapped. No. He goes, the chief of police of Chihuahua. I go, you're the bodyguard for the chief of police of Chihuahua, and you got cat? I, I think people realize the Look, the even power. Chuck Liddell by himself can only do so much. I mean, yeah. even the, the toughest person, when you're alone, you're alone. No, you're alone. And he got kidnapped. Only Jason Bourne can, like. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's Matt Damon, so you know, yeah. he's, he's got his abilities. Uh, but yeah, I understand that. You, and, but what I'm saying is, you're, as, a, as an actor, your observation, your education, how you study your role, how you observe it, gives you that earned it. And I thank you for it. And I got to tell you, when the, just the way he was so matter of fact and soft spoken, you know, infused that. Also, the character was described as, you know, very, very still, very, mm -hmm. you know. And um, when I thought about the things that he did, I, I didn't like it because, you know, I'm going, man. Can he just, you know, why does he have to do some of the things? I don't want to, you know, ruin it for some of the folks there. Yeah. But if you think about it, he was the victim. Mm -hmm. This man discovers that he, he's been, they're being ripped off. His bosses are being ripped off. Now, he brought Jason Bateman's character in and told him not to bring that partner of his and Jason as a stand-up guy said oh no he's been with me forever listen uh, that's my guy I can't, I can't you know and against my character's better judgment which we see later I, I said okay um, maybe you know maybe it's all right but my guy knew from reading people that guy's a weak link and because I wanted Jason Bateman's character's talents so much at, at the financial you yeah. know chicanery, whatever it is, I made a decision to do that. Now, if you know this world, you bring somebody on and that person steals from you and you brought them on, if you don't take them out, goodbye. It's, it's a very direct chain of responsibility or command, you know? And if it's between my family and that idiot, there is, it's, it's not, mm, mm. No, it's just sorry. You, he knew. They knew before I fully brought these guys in. We showed them what happened to the last guy. So for them to forget that, you know, and um, so that, it just, it, it helped me. It helped me in ways, again, who knew that the guy installing my cable who couldn't do it, who basically <laughs> said, mm, sorry, you're not paying me enough to do the whole house like that, would be key to my understanding of that character. I think those miracles happen to us. Like even coming, flying up here tonight, um, 
I was in a plane, and it was really comfortable. I had first class, it was really great. And I heard a little bump, it was around the tarmac. And the captain's like, excuse me, uh, we might have hit another plane, so we need to kind of go back to the hangar and just check the wing to make sure it's OK. It's United, so I'm thinking at least they're not beating me up. So <laughs> I really thought that. So I, I went, man, United. And so I go back, and they put me on another plane. Didn't go first class. <laughs> Didn't win economy, because there's no seats. And uh, so I went from, hey, I'll take another champagne, to these are some nuts. Have them. Yeah. Uh, snack pack again, please? Snack pack again. <laughs> and they just throw it at you. But the point is, um, I sat next to a woman, and she started telling me her story. And it's amazing how, as an artist, if you open yourself up, you will get your answers. And they'll come to you. And that is kind of metaphysical. It, yeah, but I didn't plan it. I mean, it's just one of those things where I'm glad I said, hang on, hang on a second. Yeah. Well, you sensed a story. Well, I tell you, when else am I going to talk to somebody who's from that region that I might get? I really just wanted something to then, then go do more stuff. But I think I got enough. You didn't have to go to Sinaloa, walk around, and ask questions. No. I didn't have to bring three keys across the border to yeah. earn my bones, you know. You're OK. You got yeah. But um, again, it's, it's life informs you if you listen, if you open yourself up. If you're not closed, if somebody said, uh, you know, your cup can't always be full because there's no more room. So you always leave a little something. I always, I presume that I don't know something. You leave a little room for yourself to grow. Otherwise, you're one of those people that's got it all figured out by 20 and you're already, you know, dying at 30, you know, if not here, you know. What I, what I love about you, you're definitely, you know, you're a great guy and a, and a, you. And a friend and uh it's, you know, I've known you a long time, and I gotta tell you, honestly. Why do you keep reminding them? <laughs> yeah, I know. Okay, we're child actors when it all Dearly started. beloved, I remember <laughs> Isai yeah. so long. Well, what ago. I'm saying is, is, this is a compliment, it's hard for me to give one. Uh, <laughs> um, I know. But I, I, I gotta tell you, you've always been one of those profound actors that truly I love your work, and you're definitely a Latino thought maker, and thank you for being on the show. Now, this is my favorite part of the show, and uh, we like to take a couple questions. Do we have, we have enough time for some questions, Cindy? I'm asking my 20 friend. questions, quick. Ken, are we okay with time? Sure. I can ask some questions. Okay, so I want to ask a few questions. Um, you know, we have a microphone here. So if you want a question, because what this also is, is a conversation where we engage. So does someone have a question for Isai? Yes, Any, sir. Anyone? I think I lost my kidney. <laughs> Didn't realize I was uh, that powerful. So. Yeah. Um, I actually want to say hello again. I work with you at Purdue University for the Latino Cultural Center. Wow. Um, and five years ago, during the same era of time, I happened to meet my fiance that same week. She's here now. We're getting married next year. Wow. So. Congratulations. You're good luck, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> well, stay away. You don't want to meet anymore. <laughs> um, overall, I guess one question I have as a writer, at the time I mentioned that I was doing screenwriting, uh, getting into it, theater, I got a minor in it, and I got a major in creative writing. wanted to figure out how to really network um, with those who have been able to make it and continue to do well. Um, what way would you recommend someone like myself to do that now that I'm out of college, in the workforce, still doing what I got going on, um, which I ended up finishing the pilot for that screenplay. So uh, actually wondering if I could pass that along to you uh, via Facebook. I'm not going to ask your personal information now, but uh, we're already connected. Overall, though, for other people that are interested, how would you really recommend someone break into that uh, arena, aside from just showing up places and hope to get a chance like this, so to speak? That's a good question, one that I get asked a lot more about acting. Um, I think Rick will have more specifics on the writing aspect of it, but in general, you know, I guess you just, you find where the deal flow is. You find where the creative, you know, community is, where other folks just like yourself are doing that. 
you know, something as simple as Google, something as simple as um, asking other writers, where, where do you do this? Because they're there, they're, there are communities out there. There are, um, I, I know that as a SAG-AFTRA um, board member, I'm always seeing workshops, I'm always seeing uh, programs that we offer for free or for a small fee, where other like-minded folks are, and, and you know, Sundance, the labs there. There are a lot of places that will give you help, and it's about doing your part in um, putting yourself out there to the universe and opening yourself up at what you're doing right now, asking. Unfortunately, I wish I had more to tell well, you, but Rick, please explain. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm a writer. I'm in the WGA and written films and TVs and everything. Writers Guild for those. Right, Writers Guild of America, I'm in the, which I call the whitest guild of America, so I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm very rare in it. But I, I would say always, you know, you have to ask, and it's a weird way, I'm mean, it's metaphysical. You have to ask the universe for something. And a lot of times, as, as Latinos especially, we're almost taught not to ask. But you have to wa walk up and let your intention be known. Hey, I, I want to be a writer. I, I'm doing this stuff. Because everyone, when they talk about Hollywood, no one's from Hollywood. We're all from places like here. From, I came from San Diego, when not knowing a single person in the business. Uh, I know, you know, it's ask, keep asking, tell friends, and also declare. Tell people you're a writer and you want to get a job because someone out there will know another writer and that writer will give you a, 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 a bit of time. They always will because the reason is it's partial survival. There are people that I, I, I'm at CBS now for 13 years and I have writers in my program and I'll tell them I might be working for you by next year. And that's the truth. So you don't know if you're talking to your future boss. So always be good to everyone. And if you're really a good guy, you will be. And so asking, what you're doing is right. I don't, you know, and keep asking. There's plenty of programs in LA. Yeah, and also networking is hard. It's hard for me because I, I'm not one of those actors that has like only famous actor friends. I, you know, if somebody famous doesn't ask to meet me, I'm like, I'm not presumptuous enough to know. Well, I don't know who wants to meet me. I'm like, hey, hi, I'm, you know, welcome to the club. We're successful. Yeah. Aaron Sorkin has a master's class I see on Facebook. You know? Check those out. Go to these classes. I took a writing class once. Unfortunately, I didn't do much with it, but I learned a lot from it. Um, the, the famous one, Robert McGee. Oh, Robert McGee, McGee John Truby, those are the two ones. Oh my God. Yeah. What I learned. We watched Casablanca. I mean, it was like, wow. Story structure, character development, all this stuff. Help me as an actor. Just like a lot of writers or directors take acting classes because they see what it's like to work with their product. A actors, you've been saying great dialogue for all your life. So therefore, you had to learn something. So, so a lot of times, actors, I'll go, you'll be a great writer. And don't, you know, be, get the best education you can. That's what I always tell everybody. Uh, Les Moonves, who runs CBS, the CEO, was a doorman at the improv. And he left that job and became who he is today. And an actor first. Yeah, and an actor. An actor first. The guy that is now in his job right now at the improv kept that job for 30 years. And less when I did, everyone has their journey. But, you know, you don't know what you're going to be. But as long as you have an education, you have an opportunity to choose what you'll be. Yeah, That's and put yourself out there, you know. I mean, I wish I could give you more specifics, but you're doing it. If it's meant to happen. We're doing the best we can right now. <laughs> uh, is that enough? OK, another question. <laughs> Thank you. Um, First of all, ni hao and doi bu qi wo bu shi wo tong wen. Well, take my class, could be here. Uh, editor is one of those uh, positions in Hollywood that we actually need so badly. Because <laughs> editor is, is one of the tougher ones. 
But the whole point is, uh, you know, what's happening now is I took a course at the Apple store. I'm going to take one coming up. I'm editing. The information is out there. If you keep studying it, you keep doing it, don't wait for permission to make it. Don't wait for permission for someone to go, now it's your time. Right now is your time. There's nothing stopping you from learning editing or working on that. And the better you become, you become valuable. And people in Hollywood were taught to look at someone and go, how can I use you? Hmm. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, how can I bring out the best of you? And I tell actors audition for me, be more of you. That's who I need to see, you. So, I, so keep doing that. Ironically, China is putting out some of the great you know, films now. So there's a huge growth in Asian filmmaking. China, Korea, I mean, amazing techniques. So it's funny, but I hear the American style is what they're all you know, pr promoting as well. So um, I have friends that are they're going to China for work. Yeah. It's interesting. Um, but uh, I, I think he, he's right. Just make yourself available for people to use. When I was 13 years old, I ran away from home. And one of the, the second time I ran away. Um, and I got a job at 13 at a restaurant that I was hanging out with, with a friend because I just kept wiping the counters. Nobody asked me to do it. I just said, look, if I'm going to be here hanging out, I'm going to help. And if you help, after a while, the boss is like, hey, you, I worked better than the people they paid. So there's, I shamed them into paying me. There's so many editors who start off helping an editor. And if you ever want to make it or, or get an opportunity, work for free. Yeah. <laughs> Hollywood loves to go, you want to work for free? Sure. Take out trash, do whatever it is. And you'll eventually be there long enough where you'll learn editing. And you'll see the window open right before your eyes. And you'll be like, ah, oh, okay. hello, no, no, yeah. I was here first. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Well, you want to make, you want to make your own movie? Yeah, because I think of my life, how the movie I want to make. Yeah, well, I, you know, there are lots of, programs, even yeah. YouTube, I mean, there, there's, this is the information age. And all you have to do is keep looking for that information. I saved about $400 once because the air conditioning fan in my girlfriend's car stopped working. And I was going to take it. They, oh, they had to take it for the whole weekend. I, so my friend says, no, dude, I, I fixed it from a YouTube video. It took me two days, two afternoons, but I did it, and I felt like a king. I fixed the thing just from a YouTube video. I was like, yes, I could be a car mechanic and make real money one day. <laughs> Next question. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Isai, thank you so much for being here and coming out to our community. Um, you indicated that you were inspired initially by Al Pacino. Among other things, but yeah, when I saw that, that was like, yeah, yeah. So that was that defining moment, I guess. Um, these days, who inspires you in your space as well as maybe in other sectors? That's hmm. a good question. Wow. That's a really good question. Who inspires you, Isai? Besides you? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> that, that, now, that's yeah, a I tough know. question. That's a tough question now. Um, the little one. Um, work from, like, you know, people that you see who, you know, just keep doing great work. There used to be one or two. Now there's like a good dozen actors, actresses that I'm like, how do they do that? Like, was that written? Did they improvise that? You know, you know Daniel Day-Lewis, you know, Javier Bardem, uh, even old friends, you know, sometimes... But I'm still inspired by those who inspired me when I was 14, too, including John Lennon, the Beatles. I have a whole real reintroduction to my childhood, like music. I mean, I'm a Puerto Rican kid from the Bronx, Latino, knowing more Beatle music than anything. And I was putting myself to sleep to their early recordings, things I'd never seen. Um, who inspires me? My God. Uh, Dolores Huerta, I just saw the documentary, Dolores Huerta, yeah. I had no idea, and I've known her for years. Yeah. Oh 
my God, go see this movie and tell your friends. She is an icon. This woman did so many things when women didn't do it in, in, in that space and still got burnt by the union she co-founded after Cesar died and still did not stop working for social justice. To this day, 87 years old, is out there telling people, do more, do this. I mean, like, yeah, I, I had a, we had her on a show, and she stayed afterwards and literally talked to everyone. Yep. And she's 87, and I was exhausted. I was like, whoa, <laughs> go ahead. I'm, no, I'm but, out of here. You know, I saw that movie. I was drawn to tears three times. Obviously, I'm a big crybaby tonight. Um, but no, you know, man, she went through it, you know. But seeing Robert F. Kennedy Jr. stand up for Cesar and Dolores and the farm workers, he grilled that governor. The p police chief, whatever, was saying, well, they were ready to commit these crimes, so they you know, arrested them. Really? He goes, well, I would suggest that on your lunch break you uh, take a copy of the Constitution and read it. I mean, brilliant. Yeah. Outclass them. What, we have, we have, I know you have to catch a flight. We, okay, well, one more question. Okay, one really? more question. No. Oh. Okay, one last question. King, when you guys put me up for the night, extra room, <laughs> I clean up after myself. Yes. I have a mic here. Oh, where is it? At? Okay, one, two, one, two. It, it's, I just yes. wanted to say that you mentioned earlier how fortuitous it was. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, just where it's behind me. How, how oh, put your hand up. I can, yeah. You're right there. Got it. Um, when you met the cable guy and what you were able to learn from him, um, you, you don't know. A lot of people here are obviously aware of your acting career, but a lot of folks are not aware of your activism. And you don't know the lives that you have touched because I happen to have made a friend in Ronnie Carmona. Sandoval, and she, you know, and her son Arthur, and she told me about the trip that you took. And I don't know how much you want to go into that, but your your story is huge. She keeps you, she keeps that story and her son alive throughout the Innocence Network. And uh, thank you very much, brother. Oh yeah, you've been a great actor. Well, okay, listen. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, if you want to see more Latino thought makers, to keep telling your friends out here. There was one other gentleman, back. though, in the oh. hat right there. Can oh. I? I'm All sorry. Right. Sure. We're not dark enough for certain types, and we're not light enough for others. Yeah. I I got to tell you, thank you so much for your support. Um, I didn't know I was running until late in the game. There were um, other folks that were going to run. I ran a few years, bef a few cycles before. You know, part of my crew, crew was like, you know, listen, you know, I, I know you probably don't have the time, you're working so much. And you, but they asked me, because these other folks that they were kind of grooming backed out last minute. And the, the, the slate didn't have a presidential candidate. And it was like, and it took me about two weeks, a decision that I, I made. And I finally said yes. And I knew that we would be outspent and that the incumbency was already running. In other words, they were doing things. I don't want to get into the specifics. But, you know, God bless them for trying. I did it because I said, okay, I have profile. I'm a people person. Unfortunately, I don't know if I'm going to do it again. I, part of me was like, I'm going to start again the next day. Because with more time, we can prepare better, get more support and more money and all this stuff. But I don't know if my complexion and lack of an administrator image hurt me. So um, there were certain, you know, in, in, in this union, it helps if you're known. 
That's why I did it. But it also helps if you look the part. So if you're a tall, patrician gentleman who looks like a board, you know, executive, you know, people just go for, it's a visual thing. And then it's not even actively racial sometimes. It's just the type, right? And I've been playing guys that, yeah, what are you looking at, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, the brink didn't last that long to change that image. Uh, so, I, you know, we just welcomed Matthew Modine to our slate, who is an amazing, not only actor, but he understands unionism. And he's just, he's a good guy, and he's a smart guy, he's smart on his feet. I'm lobbying for him to run next time, because it's not about me, it's about we. And our slate is the one that wants to fight a little harder, or a lot harder, for better contracts and more engagement within the membership. What happens is people get into power, and even those folks that, you know, this is a non-paying job, but you get the perks of the power, and you get comfortable, you become management. A little mental shift, and all of a sudden, you know, more, more this than this. So. We're that group that wants to fight harder, and because of that, we get called militant. You know? So if somebody else, more looking like the role, could run, I would love it. I ran as a sense of duty, not out of ego. And I know that it, you know, it could hurts the ego. Some people are like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm a big boy now. You know, you don't want to get associated with losing too much, but for me, it's more about serving. And as long as I keep trying and we all try together, it's not about me, it's about we. So I may, I may run again. Here's the thing, it's not about who the person is, what the platform is. So I hope you pay attention again next time and you know, weigh, weigh out the sides. But I, I was honored to run. And yeah, I kind of hurt that I wasn't much more neck and neck. We had another person running a third party which drained our votes, but we kept them honest. We kept them, you know, we didn't give it away. We made them earn it and we made them fight for it. Yeah. So and I supported him. Thank you. Yes. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you all. But good night, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Latino Thomas. Good luck. Good luck in your careers. <laughs>